Hey, this is Michael with X-Force PC. I want to talk to you about X-Plane 11. And this is for the person who's never used X-Plane 11. So if you're a user of X-Plane 11, you probably want to, already, you probably want to stop watching this because you're going to be bored. Now that being said, when you start up X-Plane 11, you, assuming you've got your licensing situation worked out, you should see this quick flight menu over here and typically you're going to pick new flight or resume last for flight and I'm just going to pick resume last flight now it's at this point that you'll be prompted because I have a separate video on it but just know that you'll need to go through that process uh, if you've never done it before so here we have um, we're in the cockpit of X-Plane and one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the settings. So up here at the top, you'll notice if you bring your pointer all the way to the top, this little menu pops out. And there's stuff over here on the left, and there's stuff all the way over on the right. All the way over on the right, with the three little bar looking thing, uh, is settings. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my sound off. Under sound, I'm just going to uncheck enable sounds. And the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want it to interfere with the video that I'm doing. Now, um, again, over in the upper right, we can go to the settings menu and some things you'll want. I'm just going to take it left to right here. Under the general tab, in general, you don't need to mess with anything in here. Um, if you don't know what this stuff does and you don't have a specific reason to be in here, I just recommend leaving all this alone. Um, kiosk mode is kind of interesting, but that's only if you're using X-Plane and multiple users are getting on. You want to lock them out of all these settings. That's what that's for. Typically, a home user doesn't need that. Over on sound, which we just were at, um, you know, we have our sounds here and all the different volume levels. Pretty self-explanatory. Under graphics is where it gets interesting. Um, if you have a fairly powerful computer, these are the settings I recommend. Um, visual effects on HDR, texture quality on maximum. It'll show you the amount of video memory you're consuming and, I re and you want to make sure that number is lower than the amount of video memory on your card. My card has 8 gigabytes and according to this I'm using 3 gigabytes. So 3000 megabytes is the same as 3 gigabytes so I'm fine here. Maximum is probably overkill. Um, you're not going to notice a big difference and it's going to have a performance impact. Under anti-aliasing, this um, is the setting I'd recommend again for a fairly powerful system. Two times I believe that super sample anti-aliasing and then FXAA as well. Um, this, These three things hit your graphics card heavily. So um, if you have a really powerful graphics card, you can bump this up a little more. Um, probably don't want to go above this because you're just going to kill your frame rate and not see a big benefit. But if you can make it all the way up to 4x SSAA with FXAA, it's certainly a good place to be. Objects, you want to try to leave that on high. Now over on this side, this at least the objects has to hit your processor more, your CPU. Um, I, I try to run mine on high when possible. Maximum has a pretty big frame rate hit. Um, I don't usually turn on draw shadows on scenery because that can that seems to have a pretty big frame rate hit and I'm not too concerned with seeing the shadows on every single object in the real world or plausible world. Down here in the bottom is where we see our monitors. I have a second monitor hooked up over here. So I have main monitor and that's the one we're using and then monitor one is just a secondary monitor I'm not using right now. Um, under main monitor I would recommend leaving resolution set to default monitor settings. What that means is use the same resolution in X-Plane that you have on your desktop. So if your desktop is set to 1920 by 1080 then that's what X-Plane will run at and that's typically where you want to be. Under visual settings, field of view, visual offsets, that's for advanced users for multiple monitor support. So only go in here kind of if you've been asked to go in here is really kind of my 
rule of thumb. One thing I will say is under field of view, this is the lateral field of view, the view in front of you in degrees. If you have an ultra wide monitor, you might want to bump this up. See how in the background X-Plane is getting further and further out? Um, but about 70 degrees is usually about right for a single wide screen. And then if you have an ultra wide, you might take it up to 85 to 90. But 70 is about right for normal monitors. Visual settings and visual offsets, that's for multiple monitors. So um, only go there if you've been provided the directions or know what you're doing. Under network, in general, you want to leave this alone unless you know what you're doing. Uh, I'm going to say that quite a bit here. Um, the one exception might be under iPhone, iPad, and external apps. If you're using ForeFlight, Wing X Pro, Flight Plan Go, Sky Demon, Garmin Pilot, um, Control Pad, um, Xavion, um, you may want to check this box here. And what that will do is broadcast all of your data, your flight data, to any iPad connected to the network. And that would allow things like these programs, for Flight, Flight Plan Go, etc., to work. Down here we have Control Pad. Control Pad is an iPad app that lets you act as a um, instructor station. Only check this box, you know, if you if you're using Control Pad. And again, it allows an iPad to act as an instructor station. Under Data Output. Here we can output various useful things to the cockpit display. You can see here I'm already outputting my frame rate. So in the upper left corner of the screen, up here all the way in the upper left, you can see my frame rate. Some other things that could be helpful to output to the cockpit display um, might be your joystick, aileron, elev elevator, and rudder. If you're troubleshooting your aileron, elevator, rudder, in other words your controls in general, this can be helpful to, to see what's going on. And you can see that in the upper left corner here. Zero means basically that it's centered. Negative one is fully deflected to the left. Positive one is fully deflected to the right. Um, over here uh, on these columns where it say, says data graph window, disk, network, leave those alone unless you know what you're doing. Just stick to show in cockpit and then you can output all this stuff to the, to the cockpit display if you so choose. And that can be very helpful troubleshooting. It can also be helpful simply if the particular piece of data that you want to see isn't vi somehow visible on any of your instruments. Over under joystick, there's a separate video on that, but this is where you would go to set up all your controllers. One thing I'll mention is this stuff down here at the bottom that gets forgotten sometimes. First of all, um, manage profiles. You would use that if you had multiple controllers and you wanted to assign certain controllers to certain planes. For instance, if you had a stick and a yoke and you wanted the yoke to work, let's say, in the Cessna 172 and the stick to work in the SR-22, then you could do that under Manage Profiles. That's what that's for. Another thing that gets forgotten is control sensitivity. Um, there you can control, well, how sensitive your yoke and your rudder and all those things are and whether or not you want some stabilization from the X-Plane software. PFC hardware. If you have PFC hardware, you know it. 99.99% .99 of you will not, so stay away from that. Under keyboard is where all the keyboard uh, um, shortcuts are. If you click on Essentials over here, then you can see some of the most used and common and useful uh, shortcuts are. And you can actually search for commands over here in the search box. Over on GPS hardware, stay away from it unless you know uh, what you're doing. If you have GPS hardware, you'll know it, and that's when you need to go over there. So stay away from that otherwise. So that's some of the settings you want to look out for. In the upper right-hand corner here, again, we've got these icons. If I click on the plane, the picture of the plane, that lets me edit my flight. So if I decide I don't want to be in Columbia Downtown Owens anymore, 
and instead I want to be in uh, LaGuardia, I can type in KLGA or I can type GUAD, or is it RD? Yeah. And just the more you spell, the more the shorter this list becomes, and you can find LaGuardia that way. You can even customize and say that you want to be on a particular runway, or you could say you want to be at a particular ramp. The other thing you can do is change the weather. You just drag this slider for basic weather settings. Keep in mind when you're, you've got it set to clear or any of these, uh, any of these uh, presets, you can go in here to customize. And you can see even under clear conditions, we still only have, I'm doing the quote thing, uh, 25 miles visibility. You can drag that up higher if you want. Um, you can also set cloud layers and wind layers over here. So you can add a wind layer. And you can drag that layer up and down and you can change the, uh, the speed of the wind and so forth. I'm not going to get into all those details right now. That This is somewhere where you can sort of play and not get yourself into trouble. If you want to play around in here, have, your, have at it and play around. I don't think there's anything you can hurt in here. Um, the other thing you can do with weather is you can have it download the real weather from the internet. So um, that's right here, match real world conditions down at the bottom. And it will actually download the weather for uh, your particular other, uh, area. So to edit the weather, you see you can, you can see it just downloaded all this information. So at LaGuardia, these are the current uh, wind and cloud conditions at LaGuardia. It just downloaded that. And you can set it up here to refresh however often you want. You know, yeah, I might say every, every 15 minutes possibly, if I want it to be very accurate. Down here, you can change the time of day just by dragging this slider. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then, of course, you pick whatever plane you want to fly. If you have a lot of planes, you can do a search. And if you want to show X-Plane planes from previous versions of X-Plane, you can click the little checkbox, and it'll show all of the planes instead of just ones designed for X-Plane 11. And then once you're done playing around, you hit Start New Flight. So continuing on, we're here in the cockpit, and some few tips for you. Um, if you use your right mouse button, so I'm clicking with my right mouse button, not left, and drag, you can look around the cockpit. This also works with the hat switch on your yoke, and almost every yoke has a hat switch. It's the little flat dome-like thing on your yoke. It allows you, allows you to look all around and um, you know see whatever's going on, even look directly behind you. And you know if you get off like this and you just want to jump back to the beginning again, you hit the W key, will center you in the plane. You can also raise and lower your eye point with the up and down arrow keys. So know that. And you can move yourself left and right. Like if you want to sit over in the co-pilot seat, you can do that. And that's just the left and right arrow keys is what I'm doing here. And again, if I hit W, it centers everything back straight again. Now, um, if you can do more advanced views, if you go to the uh, view menu up here at the upper left, these are all the internal views, and then you have external views. Like I can do a, a chase view. Now what this can be handy for is if you're troubleshooting your control surfaces, your controllers. Um, notice my elevator going up and down. I'm just using a mouse yoke right now, but let's say I had an actual yoke hooked up. I can see my ailerons and my rudder moving. I can actually, you know, visually, I can see my nose wheel. So sometimes a chase view can be handy if you're trying to troubleshoot a controller issue. Um, and then some of the views are just kind of cool. Um, if you go to like a circle view, I'm using the arrow keys right now to spin around and look all around the plane. And then once again, W takes me back and puts me right back inside the plane again. There's a lot of fun you can have with the views. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, also in the cockpit, you'll ha generally most of the planes have some form of Garmin GPS. You can click on the GPS and bring it up in a window and sort of drag it around wherever you want. 
and then just click it again to make it go away. Same with the 430 and the G1000. So just know that that is available to you. Um, that's sort of the basics of uh, just sort of getting around inside the cockpit. I'm not going to like try to tell you how to fly. You know, you can always look down if you want to see like what your throttle is doing or your mixture or if you have a prop control or see if your elevator is adjusting. Um, you can actually see your um, you know, yoke moving around. And also you can click here and make the yokes go away if you want because they can obstruct some of the buttons. So you click right there and that makes it go away. The yokes go away. And again I hit the W key and it puts me back straight again. One more thing that could be helpful to you um, that I failed to mention was the M key. M brings up the map and so that can be obviously very handy and you have these different types of maps you can show. Um, so do know that about the M key and you can uh, zoom in if you need to I believe. Yes, over here. You can zoom right on in and just keep on zooming or zoom back out again. And then you see a little representation of your plane right here on the map. 